Uh, through the Gears atmosphere, we're targeting, targeting a splashdown uh, outside uh, Jacksonville is our primary launch site yep. today. Uh, and for those, all right, so I have confirmation that deorbit burn has begun. Fantastic. Uh, you can actually see on the screen there on the right hand side, um, so that would be in front of pilot Larry Connor's view oh, yeah. on the right hand side, you can see which Draco thrusters yeah. are firing. So this deorbit burn um, lasts about 10 minutes. And uh, within the last 10 minutes, Dra Dragon jettisoned its trunk and initiated the deorbit burn just a couple minutes ago. Uh, like I said, this burn lasts about 10 minutes. And this is the last time that we'll use those four forward Draco thrusters. So those are the Draco thrusters that are on top of the capsule. Um, Dragon has not yet entered the Earth's atmosphere. This deorbit burn is what will line the vehicle up and put it on its final trajectory for the landing site, which, like I mentioned, is uh, outside Jacksonville, Florida, right. Uh, right. in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, right now, our crew uh, are using their screens to keep tabs on that burn duration. Draco thruster firings, like as we saw, mm -hmm. these, uh, so those flashes of which Dracos were firing, uh, and trajectory details like entry angle, capsule perigree, and how much distance remaining until the deorbit burn finishes. Um, so important information to have. Yeah. Uh, Dragon is flying itself, as I mentioned, so all the crew has to do is stay strapped in their seats and keep tabs on things. Now, once it's time for our crew to splash down back on planet Earth, they'll be heading to one of seven targeted sites supported by SpaceX. Uh, all of these sites are located either off the coast of, or uh, all of them are located off the coast of Florida, either in the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, spreading out the supported sites across multiple locations helps to actually maximize the return opportunities for this mission uh, and future crews, lowering the chance that we'll have to wave off due to bad weather. So uh, for those of you following along, you'll know that the high winds <laughs> have been <laughs> quite the challenge for us the last couple of days. But today, the weather is looking great for Dragon's return to Earth. Since Dragon is capable have splashed down on either side of the Florida Panhandle. We have two identical and fully equipped recovery vessels ready to support, one in the Gulf of Mexico and the other in the Atlantic Ocean. Right, and in the lead up to today, you know, SpaceX has selected primary and alternate splashdown locations off the coast of Florida, like Kate was mentioning. You know, the selection process takes into account a lot of different variables, uh, including what landing sites are available and which have favorable weather. Like you mentioned earlier, Kate, um, you know, high winds, some rain, it's all been a challenge. But um, that's why we have redundancies, right? <laughs> so, you know, today our primary landing site gets the crew home off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. And for return, we'll be looking at a number of weather items. Um, some of the obvious ones are no rain or chance of lightning in the recovery zone, uh, both for the safety of the crew inside the capsule and also the recovery teams on the water that assist crew. So we're also looking for wind speeds less than 15 feet per second or about only 10 miles per hour and relatively calm seas. So it's a pretty precise place you need to splash down in um, so that we can safely execute recovery operations, which includes landing a helicopter on the recovery ship to fly our crew back to shore. Yeah, so with all those conditions and even having seven recovery sites to yeah. choose from, uh, yeah, you can you can imagine that the teams have been doing a lot of evaluations over the last few days, yeah. trying to bring the crew home right. uh, safely and quickly, but ultimately just day after day making the call that mm -hmm. the weather um, was not playing along. Yeah. <laughs> um, so once again, uh, the weather conditions today look really good. Um, the term I like to use is super go. Super go. <laughs> um, for these operations, SpaceX closely coordinates uh, with the United States Coast Guard to establish a safety zone to ensure public safety uh, and for the safety of those involved in the recovery mm -hmm. operations, as well as the crew on board returning uh, returning with the spacecraft. Now, multiple notices are issued to the uh, Mariners in advance during recovery operations. Uh, Coast Guard and patrol boats are deployed to discourage boaters from entering splashdown zones. Right, and because of that, we want to stress to the public, you know, the need to respect this safety zone. Uh, recovering a spacecraft from the water is a very hazardous operation, and any other boats interfering in the area not only increase the risk to the astronauts in the capsule, but also the teams working to recover them from the water. 
And that's not even to say the risk that it poses to the people that are in the area. So, you know, to protect yourselves as well and the safety of the crew, uh, we recommend that you sit back and just enjoy the show, just as crews do on their splashdown. You know, we'll be bringing you the best possible views of our astronauts' homecoming. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we're getting closer and closer to the splashdown of the crew. Yep. Um, they are currently in the deorbit burn, um, which lasts about 10 minutes or so. Um, now, as you might imagine, our crew, Michael Lopez Alegria, Larry Connor, Eitan Stiba, and Mark Pathy have gone through extensive training. Each have been, each have between 700 and 1,000 logged hours since mid-2021 uh, of time dedicated to learning the SpaceX protocols, ISS systems, and to prepare for their respective research portfolios. To prepare the AX-1 crew for their mission, our teams at SpaceX spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and even running simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated inside Dragon. John, that's that capsule yeah, you and exactly. I got to visit. Yeah. Uh, now this team has studied nearly 100 different training lessons uh, covering all aspects of the mission. As the commander, Michael focused on guiding his crew through all of their SpaceX, NASA, and space station training. Uh, our trainers have told us that he demonstrated exemplary leadership in building a cohesive crew that can tackle any problem they're given and work together to solve it through effective communication. Now, as the pilot, Larry spent time developing his technical and operational skills as a first-time flyer in order to build a foundation for piloting Crew Dragon. Larry also served as the translator for his mission specialists, breaking down the technical data for his crewmates. Right, and as mission specialists, Aton and Mark spent a majority of their training becoming proficient in operating equipment, interfaces, and a suite of other tools at their disposal to support their crew members throughout the ascent, rendezvous, and return portions of this mission. But their training didn't stop there. The X-1 crew also completed zero-G flights to become familiar with the microgravity environment, as well as centrifuge training in exper to experience the exact launch and entry profiles that they'll feel during their mission. Additionally, they went through wilderness survival training to simulate and practice high-stress scenarios and medic training to prepare for potential illnesses that they might experience while on orbit. As, as the first all-private crew to live and work aboard the ISS, they have been training at NASA facilities, specifically NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, since August 2021. Each crew member has completed training in health, safety, space station systems, and emergency protocols to ensure that they can each work autonomously without interrupting the workflow of other astronauts on board the ISS. And naturally, each crew member has their own portfolio of research that they will conduct or participate in. So many of these studies have required the crew to train on the techniques and best practices of their respective principal investigators or PIs. So you know, bottom line, this crew is setting the standard in their approach to training. Uh, we talked about this on launch day. You know, they didn't take any of this lightly. They wanted to be a part of the mission and train accordingly. So they have succeeded the requirements of this mission and have certainly surpassed our expectations. You know, this mission represents more than the first fully private flight to the ISS. AX-1 is establishing many new protocols and means of collaboration between government and private institutions. So as I said, this crew really wanted to actively give back to the ISS and truly be a part of the team. But to do that, you have to go all in 100%, which they did. And by immersing themselves in their training, they really set that bar high for future space flights and partnership efforts. Yeah, it's really impressive to see just, you know, everything that they've gone through to get to this point. And it paid off, right? right. Because they ended up being in space almost twice as long yeah. <laughs> as intended. Exactly so. right. So they had to know how to live aboard up there. So, all right. Well, 17 days ago, on April 8th, the AX-1 mission launched from Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. Over the next 21 hours, the Dragon Endeavor would carry this crew to the International Space Station, at which time they would become the first ever all-private crew to be welcomed aboard the ISS. Now, of that four-person complement, this journey to the space was a first for Larry Connor, the first private pilot to reach the ISS, Mark Pathy, the second private Canadian astronaut and 12th Canadian to go to space, and Eitan Stiba, the first Israeli to live and work aboard the ISS. And there you can see the crew that was welcomed aboard. Larry there in the cupola doing some Earth observations. And Mark and Aton, again, as mission specialists. Now, so the key mission objectives for AX-1 have always been scientific research and outreach, primarily. Uh, performing meaningful science while still taking the time to communicate out the impact and application of that research. 
So space to ground events with various institutions allowed a wider audience of students, students to hear firsthand how on orbit science directly impacts us back on Earth. And including that, Earth observation activities from the ISS Cupola not only provided opportunities to study planetary biology and weather systems, but also allowed time, crew time to reflect on who we are and where we all ultimately come from. But with 10 days scheduled aboard the ISS, not a lot of time, the crew wanted to bring as many people along for the ride as possible. You know, inviting people aboard to see how they lived and operated, how food is prepared and managed. You can see there, looking at some of the, the meals. Uh, calling to order international scientific committees. Engaging with children at charter schools and science museums, all this outreach regarding STEAM education, you know, fielding their questions about life on orbit, what it is to live aboard the ISS and live in low Earth orbit. And occasionally, in Aton's case, even speaking with national leaders. Mark was also able to speak with First Nation students about the purification process of drinking water in space. You know, so ultimately, every moment was an opportunity to educate communities around the globe on what we can learn in low Earth orbit how our individual cultures add to that experience, and ultimately why we choose to go to space. Now, but outreach was only a small fraction of their effort. A lot of their time on orbit was dominated by technology demonstrations and research opportunities. Activities such as conducting the first two-way hall of portation that you can see Mark here doing, uh, you know, that really highlighted uh, how interactive augmented reality you know, has benefits in Earth-based telemedicine as well as long-duration exploration. Aton got to work on fluidic optical lens development and microgravity. This one was particularly cool to me. <laughs> I found this really interesting. Um, but it, the goal there was to show how manufacturing in space can improve optics production for deep space astronomy. Aton also got to perform a neural wellness study that assessed cognitive performance and brain activity. And while Mark got to utilize biomonitor studies to investigate new analysis techniques to detect negative effects on key organ functions. You know, but above all else, the crew of AX-1 wanted to ensure that this mission always tied back to the people on Earth. But somehow, in addition to the significant amount of research performed, the mission ultimately remained grounded in its ability to connect the dots between home and low Earth orbit. Not only appealing to both who we are, uh, but also where we are heading. Ultimately, AX-1 was a mission that highlighted why we go. And so during launch, we highlighted the significant number of research objectives that this crew had. You can see that we touched on only a small fraction of the mission's on-orbit accomplishments. That is only a part of this mission's story. So to see more of what crew accomplished in their time on orbit, please visit axiomspace.com slash AX-1 dash research, which you can see in the bottom of your screen. At this point in time, uh, I am able to confirm that Do Orbit Burn has concluded. Excellent. And it was good. Good. So we are committed to bringing Fantastic. the Axiom 1 crew home today. Uh, as we've mentioned before, we are targeting a splashdown uh, off the coast of Florida mm -hmm. near Jacksonville yep. uh, over on the Atlantic side. Now, in the background, uh, Dragon is currently inhibiting those forward bulkhead Draco thrusters that we just used to complete that deorbit burn, ensuring that it's safe to latch the nose cone and shut for re-entry. Um, so, also, uh, the vehicle has initiated the nitrox suit purge, uh, nitrox being the nitrogen-oxygen mixture, same as you use in uh, uh, your scuba tank. Uh, this will help keep the crew cool and comfortable during re-entry, uh, which is coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, at this point, the nose cone uh, is closing uh, and uh, nearly closed and is uh, protecting the, that forward hatch during re-entry. Uh, the crew are using their screens to monitor the locking of the nose cone, which is done by a set of hooks. So um, oh, there's that yes. awesome <laughs> uh, anti, or not anti, yeah. <laughs> microgravity <laughs> indicator. <laughs> Kate, you were mentioning uh, earlier when we could see over the shoulder of MLA and Aton, or uh, MLA and Larry, excuse me, uh, when we were looking at their screens, um, you could see, you know, those um, those Draco thrusters firing. Um, last night, I got to I got to watch a bit of the uh, undock, and because it was during a night pass, uh, you really got to see those Draco thrusters firing at night. Sure that was do. really cool. So I like that you get to see it on the screen too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great to be able to see the machine that you're riding yeah, exactly. in, uh, what it's doing right. uh, while it's doing it. Yeah. Uh, as we mentioned before, Dragon is completely autonomous. Um, everything from the point 
in which it separates from the second stage to the point that it splashes down. Um, you know, the, the crew has the ability, ability to act, act as a backup to Crew Dragon's systems, but the capsule essentially, um, you know, flies itself, uh, which is really important because, you know, it, it's actually safer than yep. if humans were to steer it. Right. So, <laughs> right. um, and there we can see on the screen the uh, actually the orientation of the Dragon capsule yeah. to the Earth. Um, once again, that is pilot Larry Connor on the right hand side. Well, was on the right hand side, and Commander uh, Michael Lopez Alegria was on the left. Right. So, in this view here, um, on the far left, we have Mission Specialist Mark Pathy. Uh, then to his right, Larry Connor, then MLA, and then on the far right, at the other window seat, uh, is Aton Stiba. And of course, our stowaway, the zero G indicator, Caramel from uh, Montreal Children's Hospital. <laughs> it's good to see. Yeah. Uh, now, that view on your screen there uh, is the Mission Control Center here in Hawthorne, California, SpaceX headquarters. That is where our Dragon controllers uh, are. Uh, supporting the mission, and as we enter um, the final phase of this Axiom-1 mission, which of course is the deorbit burn and splashdown. All right, so confirmation there that the uh, nose cone is closed, that is complete. Uh, so we have basically closed Dragon mm -hmm. back up. We have um, covered up the forward hatch as well as those forward Draco thrusters, right. forward being, you know, at the top. Um, and uh, that is the last physical change to the capsule prior to splashdown. Right, essentially buttoned up and ready to go, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, as we begin the second half of entry, Dragon is now beginning to flush nitrox into the cabin uh, and continuing to top off the Axiom-1 crew's suits with cool air. Again, this is what will allow the crew uh, to remain comfortable, keep that cabin temperature comfortable, uh, while the external temperatures reach uh, 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So yeah. it's pretty warm on the outside. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, the heat shield is pointing forward, leading the capsule to the landing site. Crew Dragon's primary heat shield is comprised of PICA 3.0, which stands for Phenolic Impregnated Carbon Ablator. Uh, the first gen PICA was first developed by NASA yep. for studying and sampling comments, excuse me, comets <laughs> <laughs> within our solar system. Right, and then SpaceX partnered with NASA to develop Pika X, which was the second gen product used on the Dragon 1 uh, cargo resupply missions or CRS missions that uh, successfully resupplied the space station on 20 missions. Uh, you know, Pika 3.0 was then developed specifically for use on Dragon 2 crew and cargo uh, with enhanced structural and thermal properties that optimized the heat shield and ultimately drove down cost and mass. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, the remainder of the crew of the crew Dragon capsule is uh, composed primarily of a SpaceX proprietary ablative material. It's another class of thermal protection, which is lighter weight uh, versus PICA and protects the underlying composite structure during reentry to ensure the structural capabilities are maintained. While Crew Dragon uh, will experience temperatures well over 3,000 Fahrenheit, like Katie just mentioned, uh, during peak reentry conditions, the characteristics of the TPS or thermal protection systems, coupled with the ECLIS or Environmental Control and Life Support System, uh, is the pressurized interior. Uh, and this will ensure that the Axiom 1 crew will stay cool and comfortable during all phases of reentry through splashdown. Yeah. Now, while we have said previously that this Dragon capsule is reused, um, it has come to space, it, it, it has gone to space and come back twice before, mm -hmm. so this is its third mission. Um, we keep all the, the structure, basically the structures. Um, we do replace that TPS system, right. that thermal protection system. So um, that part of the Dragon capsule, um, those are newer pieces, yeah. um, which explains why, you know, as the views that we saw while uh, the capsule was on orbit at station, mm -hmm. you know, it was a beautiful, pristine white color. Yeah. That's about to change. That's part, that's part <laughs> of reusable space flight, right? You've got to refurbish. So. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, we've talked a lot about the first of this mission and a lot about the historical nature of it. Uh, and there are many more that we simply just don't have time to cover. Um, it's been a short mission. <laughs> uh, but one of the more poignant moments was certainly watching the crew receive their astronaut pins from MLA. Now, this tradition of receiving your astronaut pin is something every astronaut is very proud of. Uh, this astronaut pin is a symbol of having ventured to space. You know, it's a major accomplishment. Uh, this history of earning your astronaut pin is rooted in the earliest days of space travel, uh, specifically with the Mercury 7, the original 7. Um, you know, they had their own pin denoting their specific flights. 
Well, since 1963, NASA provides a silver astronaut pin to NASA astronaut candidates once they've completed training and are considered mission ready. Then once they have actually flown to space, they receive a gold version of that same astronaut pin. And I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in this new era of private space flight, different providers have offered a pin to signify their flight, but there's not been a universally accepted pin for all. The Association of Space Explorers is an internationally recognized association that has kept a registry of all who have traveled to space. This registry separates all space explorers into classifications, uh, suborbital for those who fly up and right back down, uh, passing above 50 miles as they fly, and orbital for those who fly above 50 miles but also around the Earth. So this ASE created, the ASC, sorry, created a pin and have been providing them to all who have flown to space. And the very first one was provided to the family of Yuri Gagarin, the first person to ever fly to space. The insignia consists of ascending and descending chevrons crowned with a five-point star representing the journey to space and the return to Earth. A circlet encompassing the chevron is added to the astronaut insignia awarded for flight into Earth orbit and beyond. The circlet is not present on the suborbital insignia. Well, on this mission, Larry Connor, Eitan Stiba, and Mark Pathy were added to the list of orbital astronauts. And MLA presented them with their ASC orbital pins during the welcome aboard ceremony on the International Space Station. This marked the first time astronauts were presented their ASE orbital pin while on their mission. So at Axiom, we look forward to seeing many more individuals from around the world all earn their own astronaut pin. And if you watched the launch webcast of AX1, you know that one of the goals of Axiom Space is to find new ways to promote and foster the creation of space-themed art. So during the countdown on April 8th, Axiom Space launched Dragon, its very Apex, own four, NFT three, store, three. and throughout the mission, New NFTs have been minted and dropped, some of which were personally queued by Mint and by Mint by the crew while on board the International Space Station. Others were inspired by or based on the efforts of this mission. So as the AX1 crew enters the final chapter of their journey, the last round of AX1 NFTs are dropping as well. This includes the one-of-a-kind digital sculpture Spacewalker, created by artist Michael Kagan and turned into augmented reality by Anima. So be sure to check it out before the auctions close at nft.axiomspace.com. Copy that. At this time, I have no notable updates to vehicle status and recovery team status. Weather is still looking great with no significant change to the numbers I called up previously. I don't believe you have the blackout start and end times, so I have those available for you when ready to copy. I need to copy. All right, blackout start is predicted at 1653.04 and blackout end at 1659.40. I'll copy. I copy start 1653.04 and end 1659.40. Good copy. And that is all I'm tracking for you guys. Let me know once you guys have visors down, restraints tight, and tablets secured later in the timeline. We will do so. Thanks, sir. All right there, so communication with our Axiom One crew and SpaceX core, Sarah Gillis there, seated at SpaceX Mission Control, um, just behind us here in Hawthorne, California, um, just basically confirming the loss of sig signal and acquisition of signal timeline. Um, so essentially after we performed that deorbit burn and we had the final trajectory and all that good stuff, we were able to uh, run the calculations for right. that precise LOS and AOS uh, point, those points. Um, you know, important for the, the crew to know uh, yeah. when to ring back home. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, and important for all ground teams too that are listening to the nets, you know, understanding when you're getting an LOS and AOS, uh, you may not hear something for a while and you're wondering, why is that? Well, before you start, you know, thinking about things. Yeah. All right, what, what times are we expecting to lose? <laughs> 
Well, right? Now, for those of us, for those of you that have just joined us, um, that LOS or loss of signal or AOS acquisition of signal, um, that's due to the exterior temperatures of the Dragon capsule reaching 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, you know, it it sounds scary, but it's actually really helpful. You know, as they are re-entering the Earth's mm -hmm. atmosphere, that friction is actually slowing the capsule down. Right. You know, right now they're going 17,500 miles per hour, uh, and the Earth's atmosphere will act as that initial slowdown point. Um, you know, they'll feel a couple Gs. Yep, just a few, just a few. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll re-enter the atmosphere, and basically plasma builds up on the exterior of the capsule, preventing communication um, in and out of the, in and out with the crew. So um, it's only going to last, um, six you minutes. know, six minutes, yeah. and uh, the crew will be able to, you know, check in with us, and then at that point, the drogue parachutes will be deploying uh, and all that fun stuff. Yeah, so. and then doing the rest of the work. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> you know, and, you know, speaking of work, you know, crew, on this mission, you know, their main focus was research, research, research. You know, Axiom 1, uh, you know, really is a research-focused mission. Uh, and the goal was to set the standard for future private astronaut crews and, you know, usher in a new phase of microgravity research for new government and non-government entrants around the world. You know, the mission included more than 25 science and research investigations during their time aboard the ISS. And it includes the collection of pre- and post-launch physiological data. Now, among the unique attributes of the AX-1 mission has been the ability for astronauts to curate their own research portfolios in collaboration with leading institutions around the world, in addition to supporting Axiom-managed investigations. So while some of these visuals from the mission are still coming down and being made available, we want to highlight just some of the accomplishments of this crew. Mark Pathy took part in scientific research projects in partnership with six Canadian universities and their investigators, as well as proof of concepts with two tech startups, including the world's first in-space demonstration of two-way hollow portation. Yeah. Uh, he also conducted Earth observation activities in partnership with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, or RCGS, and Western University. Larry Connor's research projects were the result of longtime partnerships with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic. The Ohio native has helped fund groundbreaking research at both institutions for much of the last decade. Connor's experiments on behalf of the Mayo Clinic sought to provide data on space travel's impact on senescent cells and heart health. So while on station, Connor was responsible for maintaining these senescent cells, you know, cells that have stopped dividing, uh, that are returning with him to be studied further. So Connor's ground research with Cleveland Clinic consists of pre- and post-mission high-resolution MRIs to study the effects of the spaceflight environment on spinal and brain tissue. Eitan Stiba carried out research activities on behalf of several Israeli innovators, the Ramon Foundation, the Israel Space Agency, and the Israeli Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology. During his mission, named Rakia, he facilitated scientific experiments and conducted educational and artistic activities to connect the younger generation in Israel and around the globe with the values of peace, innovation, and social responsibility. His research projects include testing radiation personal protective equipment, as well as studies into astronaut eye health, cognitive activity, and much more. In addition to the crew curated research portfolios, Axiom Space collaborated with a variety of institutions to conduct several science investigations. Now, demonstrations ranged from Tesserae, a self-assembling technology for satellites and future space habitats, to the JAMSS JAMS photocatalyst, an air purification technology, and included research studies on modeling tumor organoids, a cancer stem cell study, and participating in the ongoing efforts of the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, also known as TRISH, which calls for pre- and post-flight collections of physiological data. So MLA helped facilitate these axiom-managed studies, as well as conducting several outreach events. So more information on the incredible works performed by this crew while on the ISS can be found at axiomspace.com slash ax1-research. Missions just like this one will open the door for new countries yeah. around the world to pursue and participate in the benefits of human spaceflight. Exactly. And you know, to that end, at Axiom, we are hard at work building the next destination in low Earth orbit. Axiom Station is being designed as a true continuation and evolution of the International Space Station. You know, so much gained over the last 20 plus years, Axiom's goal is to build upon the successes and lessons learned over that time while bridging the gap between the ISS and commercial spaceflight. Ultimately, allowing for greater access to that knowledge and capability ensures that humans continue to benefit from time spent in low Earth orbit. 
At Axiom's, Axiom's first private astronaut missions are crucial steps in learning how the relationships between government and private industry can grow and change. The International Space Station is really an amazing engineering achievement. In the last 21 years, there's been permanent human presence in space. We've slowly progressed from capsules and vehicles that visited for a short time to places like Skylab, where we ultimately did a 90-day mission back in the 70s. Now we're on ISS for a year or more. And now it's time for the next space station. Axiom Space is about making living and working in space commonplace. The government has forecasted a demand for flying NASA crew members to low Earth orbit to conduct basic research and further to their goals of deep space exploration. But then we also want to expand what can be done in space. 15 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to be surrounded by objects that we can't live without that we're manufacturing in space. Today, we are in the process of building our first two elements. We have subsystems in development. We have a full lab of life support hardware that we're putting through its paces. We are building a propulsion system. It's a lot of those details in developing a space station. You know, the first two modules are being built by our partner, Telesilania, and we're heading to what is called CDR, which is a critical design review. That really means that 90% of the design is done and then you're ready to go to manufacturing. So HAB-1 is that first module. It has four crew quarters, it has payload accommodations, and it has all of the systems uh, wired to keep crew healthy and alive. So the plan is we'll fly four separate modules to the ISS. When we arrive with the fourth module, it'll have what we need to be independent of the ISS. So a lot of thought went into how do we allow it to grow. When we look at the future, we have thoughts on how we could double the number of crew every five years. There's a lot of excitement here about the AX-1 mission. Everyone understands that it's a very historic mission. We are just so excited to be part of that and having our people enable this historic moment. The X-1 mission provides us the opportunity to refine our flight techniques and operations concepts in order to meet the higher complexity of operating a space station in orbit. That moment where we're captured in birth to the International Space Station will be a moment that defines how we move forward uh, as a species in low Earth orbit. This will be really the first time a fully commercial element has uh, been part of the complex. Axiom Station is going to allow humanity to be a multi-planet species. We pull that off, we change the world. So at this point in time, uh, the crew, they are in Dragon Endeavor. They are in their seats, their suits are on, their visors are down, uh, and they are about five minutes away from LOS, or loss of signal. Um, they are uh, basically preparing to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so they undocked from the International Space Station yesterday at 9, 10 p.m. Eastern. Um, the Dragon capsule performed a couple of maneuvers to basically line everything up in preparation for re-entry. We jettisoned the Dragon trunk to expose the heat shield, uh, and we uh, closed the nose cone after performing a deorbit burn, which was the final burn. That's the burn that locked us in, uh, committed us to splashdown today. Right. So uh, once that burn was concluded, we shut the nose cone, locked it up, and now the crew is just waiting to come back home. Exactly right. So we've got about it's looking like 16, 17 minutes until splashdown. If that's correct. Yeah. Um, you know, so crew has had a long time on orbit. You know, originally they were supposed to have 10 days. They've got 15 days on the ISS, 17 in full spaceflight orbit. Um, you know, you mentioned yesterday they undocked at uh, 110 GMT, and you know they had about well, I think 16 hours, uh, 16 hour travel time. So, you know, so they got a few extra orbits in there as well. Yeah. Um, they've had a few extra everything exactly, on this mission. <laughs> exactly right, exactly right. But they've been making the most of it, you know. Um, they went into this mission with a huge suite of research on their plate. And I think that extra added opportunity was, or that extra time, you know, just highlighted if we have opportunities up there, we want to learn more, right? We, we just saw in the video uh, what we're trying to learn from this mission really is 
how do we all work together to continue this amazing experiment that has been sustained low Earth orbit for 20 plus years? You know, one, of my, one of my favorite things uh, at Mission Control in, at Johnson Space Center is the ISS mission elapsed time. And you go and you see that and it just, it dawns on you how long that vehicle has been up there operating. We want to continue that, you know? Um, everybody working in private space flight wants to continue that and everything that we benefit from. Um, so seeing that video, you know, us talking about, you know, the vehicle coming home, seeing the multiple patches inside the Dragon today, it's all part of that story. Yeah. It's all part of that mission. So even if that mission is 10 days or 15, um, we get a lot out of it and we learn a lot from it. So. Yeah. Now, for those of you that have just joined us uh, or might not be familiar with, uh, you know, what the Axiom crew has been up to, uh, they did launch on, when was that, April 8th. Mm -hmm. uh, the mission was initially intended to be a, an eight-day mission. Uh, it ended up being 15 days. Right. <laughs> so if you, uh, 15 days on, on station, total right. of 17 days right. on orbit. Um, unfortunately, the weather just wasn't willing to play nice with us around <laughs> Florida, um, as we mentioned before. We have seven recovery options around Florida, both on the around Florida, both on the Gulf side and the Atlantic side, right. um, and we take into account lots of different things: um, lightning possibility, precipitation levels, wave height, wind speeds, um, all kinds of things to make sure that the crew as well as the recovery teams are are safe for the operations. And unfortunately, we just haven't been able to pull that off for nope. the last week, um, even with those seven right. options, those seven locations. So um, fortunately, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we are fully committed to Splashdown um, having performed that final mm -hmm. deorbit burn. Um, we are intending to splash down off the coast of Florida on the Atlantic side right. near Jacksonville. Uh, and the weather is beautiful today. Right. We are we are super go with there our weather There's conditions. That term. There's yeah. that term. We're waiting for the super go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So we are expecting loss of signal to begin uh, at around the 53 minute mark, which is now. Um, so waiting to hear uh, on the nets the call out for that. Uh, once again, the crew uh, this are, are expecting this, mm -hmm. um, you know, this, uh, let's see, six minute LOS period. Um, wait, that's not six minutes. Yep. Yeah, there that's we go. Six minute LOS. Uh, and yeah, so totally anticipated. Mm -hmm. Every crew that we have brought back down to Earth has gone through this um, at that point in time. The capsule is re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. It's actually using the friction provided by the atmosphere to slow the capsule down uh, prior to the drogue chute deployment. You know, the, the crew is currently going, was going 17,500 miles per hour. You know, that's the, the velocity, the speed of the, of the space station. And so the Earth's atmosphere actually acts as that initial slowdown period. Right, that's the drag that yeah. we get to help slow it down efficiently. Absolutely. Right. So once we get through the atmosphere, um, the capsule's then going about 350 miles per hour, at which point we deploy two, two drogue parachutes, which provide initial slowdown as well as stabilization. Okay. And then after the two initial drogue parachutes are deployed, we get the four mains, uh, which are those orange and white parachutes that are uh, very iconic, super noticeable, right. uh, and we are hoping to, you know, to have all of that uh, views of that soon. Uh, exactly. But right now, the crew um, they are in an expected uh, loss of signal, um, and we expect this to to go on for uh, a few minutes. Exactly right. Yeah. At this point, they're just suited up and kind of waiting. Right. Yeah. Dragon's doing all the work. Uh, crew is monitoring, obviously, um, and you know, following along for the ride. Um, but they are suited up. They are visors down, and they are waiting for splashdown. So there on your screen, you can see Mission Control Center here at Hawthorne, California, you know, just right behind John mm -hmm. and I. Uh, and uh, the crews there are uh, monitoring the telemetry uh, and everything that, that um, we can track on Dragon. As we mentioned before, that communication, um, you know, that's not an option because that heat shield is slowing the vehicle down significantly. Uh, the external temperatures of Dragon reach about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. There's plasma building up on the side of it, uh, and so that's what prevents the right. ability to really get any telemetry or communication from the from the capsule at that point in time. Um, but we will hopefully be able to get views of the capsule. Well, right. of course, we'll we'll be able, we'll bring that uh, to you as we as we have those available. Uh, the first shot might be a thermal shot. That's right. uh, what it has been in the past. Well, which, heated up to 3,500 yeah. degrees. It's a little easier to see. <laughs> yeah, infrared's going to catch that <laughs> for sure. But at this point, you know, the crew is they're in they're they're in their seats. They're mm -hmm. buckled up. Um, they are. I 
think it's about 4Gs that they experience uh, during the re-entry period, um, but it's, you know, they, they've trained for it. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly about right. the same as they experience throughout um, liftoff as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, so as I mentioned before, at this point, we're in that communications blackout period, uh, lasting about six or seven minutes due to the formation of plasma around the spacecraft. During this time, no vehicle telemetry is received by mission control or the recovery team, and no external commanding of the vehicle or voice communication, as I mentioned, is possible. Uh, now, as a reminder, Dragon is designed to fly itself and continues to autonomously use its Draco thrusters in order to orient itself during reentry. During reentry, the vehicle will be slowing down from its orbital velocity, which, as I mentioned before, is about 17,500 right. miles per hour, uh, down to about 350 miles per hour. Uh, and the top temperature that Dragon will experience upon reentry is 3,500 degrees, which sounds toasty. Uh, <laughs> I always like to say that we get a toasted marshmallow back from toasted space uh, because that white thermal protective yeah. protection system, or TPS, as you hear us refer it to, um, you know, it does get toasty. But the crew, they're comfortable, right? Right, <laughs> right, right. You know, and that, and that TPS system, that's doing all of the hard work to keep crew safe, yeah. right? Um, the ECLA systems inside the pressurized part of the vehicle are also doing the same, to keep crew safe, to keep them comfortable. Um, but those, those two systems have a very, very important job to do, um, in addition to, you know, the, um, the drogue parachutes, like you mentioned, right? Each of these systems, um, as part of the overall uh, Dragon capsule, has a very uh, specific and choreographed, you know, aspect to safely allow crew to re-enter. Absolutely. Uh, and then once they splash down, you know, there it's ground teams. You know, ground teams are really carrying, um, ensuring that the vehicle is safe. And there's uh, our first view of Dragon Endeavor re-entering the Earth's atmosphere with the Axiom-1 crew. And heat shield doing all that work to keep that, uh, to keep that ablative heat, or to keep the heat ablated from the vehicle uh, as it's re-entering at those speeds. Yeah, so this is a shot from our infrared tracking camera. know that right, and that was one of the critical roles uh, earlier of the getting acquisition dragon spacex com check I'm not clear Sarah cruise to its side copy that great to hear from you All right, there we heard the voice of Commander MLA, Michael Lopez Alegria. Uh, they're just confirming that the, the crew, yep. they're doing good. Right on schedule, too. Yeah. As we mentioned before, the external temperature of the capsule is about 3,500 degrees as it, uh, you know, makes its way through the Earth's atmosphere. But the crew, they're comfortable inside. Uh, Dragon, well, you can expect automated parachute deploy on at standard altitude. Copy that, sir. All right, so just a heads up there to the crew that they can expect to feel those initial drogue parachutes deploy. Right. Um, as I was saying before, the crew is comfortable. You know, they, the, while the exterior of the capsule is warming up, we are purging the, um, the internal cabin and their suits with nitrox or nitrogen oxygen mi mixture to keep them comfortable and cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, as we're waiting for confirmation that dragon shoots have deployed, uh, you know, just prior to the deployment of the initial drogue chutes, Dragon will automatically safe the propulsion system. Uh, Dragon then deploys its drogue parachutes to stabilize and decelerate the vehicle, like you mentioned earlier, Kate. Now, just before the, the, the deployment of those drogue parachutes, seats automatically rotate 26 degrees to keep the crew within acceptable um, or G limits for entry and landing. Uh, without the drogue chutes, we would have to make the mains three times stronger and heavier. Um, and of course, everything about spaceflight is about weight. Right. So if Dragon you... SpaceX, brace for drogue window. Bracing. All right, so just a couple moments here until those drogue parachutes are released. 
shortly after the drogues are released, we'll see the release of the main parachutes, right. which help to further decelerate the vehicle and allow the vehicle to proceed safely to the splashdown zone uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. The vehicle's velocity at drogue deployment is about 350 miles per hour, and they deploy at about 18,000 feet. From that deploy, it's a pretty quick succession of events, right? We deploy the drugs very quickly after. There we go. We're seeing the drugs deploy now. Live view from onboard Dragon Endeavor of those drogue parachutes. Capsule's going about 350 miles per hour. Nominal ascent rate for two healthy drogues. It's what you love to hear from inside yeah, the capsule. Exactly. Because unfortunately, they can't see right. uh, the parachutes. So to hear that call out that their drogues are healthy, it's great news. So there's a better shot of Beautiful those drogue shot. parachutes from our tracking camera. You know, and having that single voice of the core talking to crew, coming, at, letting crew know that they're going into a planned LOS mm -hmm. and then coming back. All right, there's the four mains deploying. All right, so we visual. have visual on four mains. So there we heard that confirmation of four mains deploying. And the center is nominal. Gorgeous shot of those four main parachutes. 1,000 meters. Copy, 1,000 meters. So just the crew reporting that they're only 1,000 meters right. uh, from splashdown. Right. Landing in water is simpler, therefore more reliable, um, and it provides more margin against unlikely parachute issues. Um, you know, we had to learn how to make Dragon waterproof, <laughs> but once you do, that's it. It's a rinse, review, reuse type process. Right. 800 meters. Copy 800. Once again, our Axiom-1 crew is targeting a splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean uh, at our Jacksonville recovery zone. The recovery teams uh, are in the area waiting for that splashdown confirmation. Scheduled for about two minutes from now, according to our clocks. 600 meters. Copy, 600. So we can see that capsule there, as I mentioned before, you know, when we saw it on station and of course during launch, it, you know, it was pure white. Right. <laughs> it is no longer. Right. Uh, we now have really a beautiful shot of that toasted marshmallow. Um, you know, that, that thermal protection, those thermal protection systems, right. um, you know, keep the crew safe. Copy 400. Right. Like you said, you know, that's, that's a testament to the design of the vehicle doing exactly what it was designed to do and what it Absolutely. has to do to do it safely. And like you said, rinse, reuse, right? It's all part of reusable spaceflight. First live view of our crew there from inside the Dragon capsule now that they have re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. 200 meters bracing for impact. Copy bracing. I think I see that zero-G indicator in the lap of mission specialist Mark Pathy there. That's right. <laughs> the crew is looking comfortable in their view that we saw there, ready to splash down just a few moments from now. And right now, I think those parachutes slowed the vehicle down to about, is that about 50, 50 miles, miles per hour? hour. Yep. As you can tell by the cheers behind us, we can confirm that the Dragon capsule with the AX-1 crew has, has splashed down. Dragon Endeavor has returned home with the Axiom-1 crew.
Dragon SpaceX, we see splashdown and mains cut. We can turn. SpaceX recovery ship and team that you see there on your screen has been waiting for Dragon Splashdown, and they're now making their way to that location. On behalf of the entire SpaceX team, welcome back to planet Earth. <laughs> the Axiom-1 mission marks the beginning of a new paradigm for human spaceflight. We, in hope you, we hope you enjoyed the extra few days in space, and thanks for choosing to fly with SpaceX. Sir, to you, Ken, the team, and MCC, and all the teams that are supporters of all the engineers, technicians, and job placements. We're very grateful for the mission. Thank you. All right, well, good calls there from MLA and CORE. And we copy all. Crew excited to be home. All of us on ground happy to have crew back home. Now, the teams have been ready and waiting for about three, three nautical miles away, so it's going to take them about 30 minutes to make their way uh, to get the crew inside Dragon. So there we can see those two drogue parachutes, which were released, of course, first, and right. then, you know, they are let go in order to release the mains. Uh, that's what we see making their way exactly. back to Earth as well, of course. <laughs> the whole system comes back. Yeah. Sarah, we're in section three. We think we're in stable two. We can't see very well out the windows. That's regarding that's stable one. And Dragon, your comm is getting pretty hard to hear. Uh, maybe we can have Larry relay some of that. We're just uh, confirming we've got fog freezing on the windows that we are in stable one. Certainly feels like it appears to be. Copy that, Larry, and can confirm we'd see stable one as well. Thank you, by the way. Uh, my thanks to you, everybody. Ex all the people who have supported us around the world, just an uh, amazing job and amazing mission. Appreciate the words, Larry. So that was our pilot, Larry Connor, also just expressing his thanks. Now we can see the Dragon capsule. So I just want to, you know, kind of inform a little bit about what yeah. those calls were. So we, we heard the crew basically wanting to confirm um, stable one, stable two. Um, so that's basically just the position that the, ca that the capsule splashes down in. Um, so stable one being this primary upright, um, stable two would be like it's a little bit more on its side. Okay. And that's why they said, can't really tell, can't mm. quite see out the window. Okay. Um, I have a feeling they were like, well, based on, you know, the way that How we're feel. Fe fitting right. in the seat, we're right. Right? We think we're this way. Um, so uh, that's just confirmation of the position that. False Quindar tone. Yeah, false Quindars. <laughs> you hear Quindars uh, key up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so the recovery teams uh, are now uh, starting to approach the Dragon capsule. Dragon SpaceX, we are go for recovery personnel to approach. You can expect personnel alongside in about one minute. Perfect. So there's that safe approach call. Understand one minute. Yeah, so the reason why the recovery team doesn't just rush there, um, so Dragon is loaded with hypergolic propellants, uh, monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, and they are toxic right. when you breathe them. Right. So for the safety of the crew, both you know inside and the recovery team, um, we wait for Dragon to you know basically double, triple check that all of those vents and everything are closed off and there's no venting from the Dragon capsule, like from those uh, Draco thrusters themselves. So that's what that um, communication was in terms of making sure that we, we got the okay from the capsule right. and then Mission Control gave the okay to the recovery team. And we can see them there 
there will be an individual that actually climbs on top of the capsule, <laughs> uh, and they are placing the the harnessing and the rigging and, essentially yeah, for hoist. Exactly, okay. uh, the equipment that's required in order to uh, lift Dragon onto the recovery vessel. Infrared shot there of that fast boat, um, as we call it, mm -hmm. approaching. And they're basically doing another um, sniffing test, essentially, where they're, you can see that they, the team has, um, has PPE on, personal protective uh, protection equipment, uh, respirators to, yeah, respirator to do a, a triple check mm -hmm. that the vehicle is not releasing any of those uh, toxic hypergolic vapors. Right. And as we mentioned earlier, this is a very you know, coordinated maneuver, right? The weather has to be right. The area has to be clear. You know, we mentioned how it's important that, you know, other people are not in the area uh, because this is, as Kate mentioned, um, you know, you have the, the safety aspects of the of the um, hypergol that you need to worry about, but also just what crew is trying to do there. That's not an easy thing to do in the water. Um, having done a few boat maneuvers myself, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not that easy to be doing what they're doing. So having having the area clear for these teams to work um, and, and make contact with crew, um, but while also performing these maneuvers is really important. And you can see as well why we had to wait for such a super go for clear conditions yeah. and weather <laughs> on a splashdown day. Even with nominal seas like that, um, you know, this is, a, this is an operation that takes a lot of attention um, and a lot of work on, on ground crew's side. Now, one thing I want to mention, um, you know, we have talked about Commander MLA Michael Lopez Alegria, how he has been to space before. Uh, this is the first time that he has made a water landing. Right. So, um, right. you know, he landed back on land uh, with the space shuttle and the Soyuz. Right. Uh, so, this water landing, you know, we got to got to keep it interesting, right? Got to got to you know get to do something new. Yeah. So there we can see one of the SpaceX recovery uh, team members has climbed on board Dragon in order to start uh, essentially equipping Dragon with the, uh, the things that we need in order to lift it or hoist it up onto the recovery vessel. Right, so on that note, Kate, you know, looking ahead at some of the operations ahead of us, you know, once once the team is done rigging, uh, the next big phases of this are really to bring a recovery ship. We're waiting for a Dragon, time. SpaceX, come check. I have you loud and clear, sir, I'll be. Have you loud and clear as well? Just wanted to verify a calm configuration update. For awareness, um, it appears we have a couple parachutes that are going to be need to towed, need to be towed out of the way for the recovery ship to approach. Um, so there might be a slight delay to schedule, but we'll get you an update on timing soon. Copy all. All right, so on your screen, we could see the recovery teams basically lassoing mm -hmm. the Dragon capsule mm -hmm. in preparation. Now, we did hear a little bit of new information there from SpaceX Core, which is the crew operations and resources engineer, Sarah Gillis, uh, just letting us know that a couple of those parachutes that came down with the Dragon capsule, um, that you know, once the Dragon capsule lands, we cut the lines to right. those parachutes um, so that, you know, if there is a little bit of wind, the Dragon capsule doesn't get pulled along with right. the, the parachutes. Now, those parachutes, uh, we do recover them, uh, and we're, you know, we just heard some information there that we need to basically move them out of the way in order for that recovery vessel to make, the, the larger recovery vessel, the primary vessel to make its way uh, to the splashdown site. Right, which you can see the team's doing there, right? Pulling some of the parachute out of the way. And, you know, it's a good call on core to, you know, have that comm check and then let them know, let crew know, hey, there's been a slight deviation to the schedule, all nominal, all's good, but want to give you a heads up. If I were inside Dragon Capsule, I would really appreciate yeah, exactly. that information exactly. because, you know, as we as we see 
how the the ships, or excuse me, how those boats are moving and how the capsule is moving. Uh, that movement is a little less dynamic right now, but a couple minutes ago, I was you know I was watching the Dragon yeah. capsule and I thought I would probably be feeling a a little unwell right. <laughs> right. Uh, with that rocking motion. So, you know, just for mental preparation yeah. and stabilization, yeah. knowing, all right, I might have two or three extra minutes to get through this. Kind of acclimate I can myself do this. a little bit. I can yeah. hold on. Right. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX for internal video. Go ahead, sir. If y'all are feeling up to it, request permission to come on board via the display camera view only. Permission granted. Copy that. So soon we should be getting a internal view of uh, soon we should be getting an internal view of crew inside the Dragon capsule. For those that have just recently joined us, uh, after 17 days on orbit, 15 of those days uh, on the International Space Station. We can see that the Axiom-1 crew has returned home to planet Earth. Uh, just a few minutes ago, they made their splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean uh, off the coast of Florida near Jacksonville. And there we can see our recovery teams uh, working the capsule in preparation for um, lifting it onto the recovery vessel. And there we have a shot of Mission Control Center uh, here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, where John and I are located. Yeah. You know, what I, what I particularly loved, oh, there's a great shot from inside the Dragon. So this is just after splashdown now. We've got a shot over the, over the shoulders of Commander MLA and Pilot Larry Connor. So they are waiting inside the Dragon to be hoisted up now. Yeah, we can see that they have lifted their visors. So that's the clear part uh, there, which is currently on top of their helmet. But during the dynamic portions of, uh, like of the mission, so for launch, for docking, uh, for undocking, right. and for splashdown, uh, you know, we we do ask them to close their visors. Right. So now they're able to open it up and. Um, you know, as we mentioned before, we, we have been flushing the interior of the cabin as well as the inside their spacesuits themselves uh, with cool nitrox, nitrogen oxygen mixture, in order to keep the crew comfortable, exactly. uh, you know, throughout the recovery process. It's amazing to me all the, all the work that those suits do, right? We were talking just a what feels like a few days ago uh, during launch about how those suits keep them cool. You know, even just from the drive from from launch, uh, from the launch pad, or from, from the um, uh, suit room out to the launch pad and then up through the vehicle, but all the work that they do while on orbit and then coming back down. Now, earlier, Kate, when you um, showed the shot, or when, when when we saw the shot of Mission Control um, during splashdown, for those who weren't able to, you know, join us while we were splashing down, I loved hearing the cheers uh, from everybody here. You know, it it was something I expected on launch day, um, but it's moving to hear it on splashdown too. You know, it shows how many people are vested in the entirety of the mission, not just launching. Not just on orbit operations, but coming back to, you know, a mission is start to finish. Absolutely. And that was really, really comforting to hear. Early Monday morning here, you know, there are still people standing outside of mission control here. Oh, 100%. Cheering it on. I love it. We wouldn't miss it. Yeah. <laughs> Live view there inside Dragon Endeavor with the AX1 crew. They have splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean and the recovery teams are working to prepare the capsule for lift onto the recovery vessel. Uh, after Dragon is in, on the recovery vessel and you know, uh, fastened down, the teams will actually open up the side hatch and um, you know, poke their head in and you know, get a quick thumbs up from the, the crew and uh, you know, one by one we'll, we'll see the crew egress or exit from the capsule using that side hatch. So once that side hatch opens, 
uh, it's actually the first time it's opened since it closed right. on launch day right. because in order to get on board and exit the space station to egress and all that good stuff, we use the forward hatch, the right. hatch that's at the top of the capsule. But the nose cone was covering, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and the side hatch hasn't been open since launch day. So they, 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 end, they, they got into the capsule on launch day. The, that side hatch was closed, and so when that side hatch opens today, it's their first breath of fresh air yeah. <laughs> since, since taking off. As we noted earlier, it's going to take a bit of time for the uh, recovery vessel to uh, to make its way to Dragon. Um, uh, we got a call from CORE saying that you know we had to get some parachutes out of the way so the ship can make a safe approach. Um, but at this point, the, the rigging teams are working um, to make sure that Dragon is ready to be hoisted on that vessel as soon as it gets there. Yeah, absolutely. As we've mentioned before, you heard us say it already today. You heard us say it a ton on launch day. Everything is carefully choreographed when it comes to space flight. Um, you know, the, the fact that the core communicated to the crew just to let them know, hey, there's a slight delay, or we can anticipate a, yeah. a slight delay. Um, you know, it's all about safety is what it comes down to. The safety of the crew on board, as well as the safety of the support teams. Um, you know, in this case, the recovery teams there in the water with the crew. Right. That is priority number one above all else. And uh, just making sure that everything we is planned for step by step mm -hmm. um and even in i don't i don't want to call you know the parachutes in the way off nominal because it that is a normal thing mm -hmm. to happen mm -hmm. but it wasn't you know we didn't plan for it yeah. right yeah um so you know for something like that where it's like okay the parachutes are in the way cool you know, we have margin dragon spacex for private medical conference and you have procedures for that as well absolutely Go ahead with the DMT. For All right, so we're hearing that we're about seven minutes out until we get to lift Dragon Endeavor onto the uh, recovery vessel that you see there on your screen. The arch that, so that that individual there standing at the end of the, of the ship, there's an arch above them, and uh, that arch will actually articulate downward and um, the teams in the water will attach the harnessing and everything required to hoist or lift Dragon out of the water and into that cradle there. Um, fun fact, that recovery vessel um, the fun fact that that recovery vessel is named Megan <laughs> after Megan MacArthur Fantastic. who was uh, who was our pilot for the Crew 2 mission, our other recovery vessel for, for Dragon Capsules, which, you know, as we mentioned before, there's seven sites around Florida. Um, we have one recovery vessel here in the Atlantic, that's Megan. The other Dragon recovery vessel located in the Gulf is Shannon for, of course, uh, Shannon Walker, yeah. who was the first woman to fly on a Dragon capsule. So um, we, we have Megan and Shannon on board <laughs> uh, in our hearts and, uh, and, of course, in name here with our recovery vessels. There we can see Megan making a slower approach uh, now uh, coming, up to, coming up to Dragon Endeavor. So once Dragon splashes down, there's uh, a couple of fast boats. Um, you know, I should I should preface by saying that the recovery team is um, about two or three miles away from the splashdown site. You know, for safety reasons, nobody can be super close. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so, 
Uh, the team is situated close, but not too close, and those fast boats, the smaller boats. Dragon SpaceX, I copied calm on the whining noise. Do you have any insight of when that started? I think it started right at splashdown. Copy that. I was about to ask you about it. It's uh, fairly high pitch, quite loud, and it varies in frequency a little. It's hard to tell if it's a mechanical fan ventilation of some kind, or maybe some kind of um, ascot of vent. It's hard to tell. So just a little... Copy Dragon, we hear it. Um, likely it is caused by a bilge pump that started at Splashdown. We're going to attempt to power that pump off. Let us know if it resolves. Copy. All right, so just a little bit of interesting communication there with the crew inside Dragon Endeavor as well as uh, our team here in Mission Control. So when the crew was speaking, that was uh, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria. The teams here were able to hear background noise. Um, and so obviously <laughs> the crew inside Dragon Endeavor are able to hear that as well. Mm -hmm. So that was just a little bit of back and forth describing what where the sound may have been coming from or what it could have sounded like. And it sounds like it might be one of the onboard pumps that activates at splashdown. Hey, thanks, Endeavor. Whatever you just did, stopped it. Hey, good work Stop y'all. It was a bilge pump. There we go. It's what we do. We solve problems. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> That's the life of the flight controller. Right? Absolutely. Uh, so the recovery teams are, as, as I mentioned before, they're positioned close to the splashdown site, but for a safe distance away. Upon splashdown, the fast boats make their way out quickly to do the initial safing uh, in preparation of the capsule, making sure that the um, hypergolic uh, propellants are not leaving any vapors uh, around the capsule. And here we can see our recovery vessel, Megan, making its way slowly but surely uh, to the capsule and its splashdown site. Once again, uh, the capsule will be hoisted up onto the deck into that cradle. And in a very sleek and swift motion, that cradle uh, moves forward uh, toward the platform where we will see the crew egress uh, and head into the medical base. Once again, when that side hatch opens, it's the first time that that side hatch has opened since launch day, which was back on April 8th. First breath of fresh air since yeah. April 8th. And earlier, Kate, you were mentioning, you know, every, every bit of this operation, um, I mean, for all of spaceflight, is safety first, right? And when you're this close to the finish line, it's even more critical to, you know, follow those procedures to absolutely take it slow and steady, right? Everybody wants to get across that finish line right now, but the mission's not over till they're safely back on board and you can open that hatch and get that breath of fresh air, right? So, For sure. you know, those fast boats make that initial contact and Megan is coming up, you know, in good time, following along with the timeline and making sure that we safely get Dragon back on board. We can see that there are some swells in the water today, um, but the waves themselves are, you know, almost non-existent. You know, really small waves there. Um, we can see that skies are mostly blue with some clouds. As we mentioned before, uh, with all of the weather factors that we take into account for, so things like precipitation levels, um, wind speeds, wave height, you know, uh, lightning in the area. Yeah. Um, those are all factors that play into whether or not we get the the go for undocking and the go for splashdown, which you know over the last few days has been the the challenging factor for us. Uh, as we mentioned before, the crew was originally supposed to be uh, in space for eight days, ended up being in space for 17 days uh, due to those those weather um, those weather restrictions essentially, where we we just couldn't get. Go criteria met for those various conditions. Yeah, all those variables have to add up to the right solution, right? And you can have one variable, it's great. We don't have a lot of wind, but if you have rain in the area, 
it makes it really difficult to do those 24-hour go-no-go calls. Okay, so right now it looks like we can see that the recovery 